Marvel Spider-Man for PS4 developed by Insomniac Games was lauded by critics and fans as a triumph, but the reality falls somewhere more complex than that. I find the game both as charming and flawed as Peter Parker himself, played by Yuri Lowenthal. This video, shown with just footage of Peter swinging around open world fun, will be a critique of the game's narrative, and to some extent its narrative design and how gameplay affects the experience. SPOILERS for Marvel Spider-Man follow! So if you're a Spidey fan and you haven't played the 2018 game, I suggest you do so before watching this video. It's still a fun time despite my issues and concerns over parts of the story written by longtime Spidey Comics writer Dan Slott and his co-writer Christos Gage. Now if you're still here, let's begin. Now first we're going to dive back into a little bit of Spider-Man's history, which the game beautifully does by uh, letting you unlock the different Spider-Man costumes from over the years in his incarnations in comics and movies. The character was created in 1966 by the writer-artist team of Stan Lee and Steve Ditko, who also worked together to make Doctor Strange. Ditko left the book after 38 issues due to creative dif differences with Stan Lee. Ditko, whose artwork perfectly fit a lanky, anxious figure of Peter Parker as well as the ankle acrobatics of Spider-Man, identified with Russian author Ayn Rand's objectivist philosophies, which believes in stark ideas about good and evil. Stan Lee wrote out a story in which Spider-Man sympathizes with the plight of student protesters, protesters ugh, speaking out against the Vietnam War, and Ditko created, considered such protesters to be lazy freeloaders. Kind of a weird, uncomfortable dude, Steve Ditko that is, when it gets down to it. Anyway, John Romita Sr. came in and developed the friendlier, rounder face Peter Parker and Spider-Man that came to influence future interpretations, perhaps as much as Ditko's. The worry and anxiety stayed, but the shadowy visual paranoia and the kind of close, tight, nine-panel grids left those stories. The next version of the character that majorly affected my consciousness was the 2002 Sam Raimi-directed Spider-Man movie, followed by the wonderful sequel and a mixed but oddly hilarious third entry. Tobey Maguire captured my heart as a sweet, lovelorn boy. Boyfriend material, for sure. Kirsten Dunst and the rest of the cast did great as well. Now, you may be recently familiar with the Marvel Cinematic Universe version of the character, a much younger Spider-Man, played by Tom Holland, first introduced in Spider-Man Civil War, where he wore this charming homemade suit. Now, Spider-Man uh, gets a Stark suit, the Tony Stark suit, um, after Tony Stark recruited Spider-Man in Captain America Civil War. This got followed up with a delightful Spider-Man Homecoming, starring co-starring Jacob Batalon, Laura Harrier, Zendaya, and Michael Keaton as the villain the Vulture. And following the events of Avengers Endgame, Tom Holland wore this costume in the recent Spider-Man Far From Home. Now here's the white spider costume designed especially for the game, which Dr. Otto Octavius, not yet Dr. Octopus, designs for Peter. Early on in the story, Peter, now in his mid to late 20s, works with Otto as a lab assistant, not yet a science teacher as he was in J. Michael Straczynski and John Romita Jr.'s run of the comics, and Otto, coming back to work late at night with the lab with some, uh, some Chinese food, catches Peter in a wrecked spider suit and designs this new one for him, And but Doc Ock assumes we think that Peter is the one to design Spidey's suit and equipment only, not being Spider-Man himself. We later on learn that Doc, of course, knew from that moment that Peter was Spidey. I mean, it really was a little too convenient in that point in the story if Doc truly hadn't figured out Peter's secret identity. Speaking of Doc Ock, Slot's vision for the villainous arc falls squarely into an offensive and troubling atheist tro or excuse me, ableist, not atheist, trope in which Otto Octavius' problems with his own disabilities is what leads him to create the robotic arms and become a villain. The severity of the ableism on display was brought up by one of my Twitch viewers who has disabled their self. When it comes to issues of identity, writer Dan Slott has proved sloppy. Recently, Slott tweeted that Peter Parker is meant to be an everyman and thus could be of any religion. The idea of a white straight cis guy re representing an everyman, or even a sexist term everyman, is absurd. Um, although, what I... This is my interpretation. I talked to a friend who believed that when people say everyman, they simply mean working class. So, 
perhaps there is truth to that term. But anyway, um, Peter Parker is a white working class guy from Queens. You know, he's not uh, any other identity or any other religion. This is so. This is kind of, in my idea, bunk compared to the far superior message of sp the movie Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, where Peter Parker, Peter B. Parker, says to Miles Morales, "Don't do it like me. Do it like you." The game plays it safe in nearly every way, as some comedy Johnny pointed out in his review. Much like Batman Arkham Asylum with Rocksteady's Batman, I think the main concern was getting a Spider-Man to work when so few before had. Shout out to the movie tie-in game Spider-Man 2 on the PS2, though. One great credit I can give to the game designers, and I would say, uh, from my small experience making games, mostly little twine games and stuff like that, visual novels, that narrative design is game design in some ways, so that's how I can justify including this bit in a narrative crit. Anyway, like Celeste, the one great credit that I can give to the game designers is their focus on adaptive difficulty as opposed to the boneheaded get good credo that many gamers and game designers go by. And if you're wondering, I'm going after Cuphead, not Dark Souls. At any time in Spider-Man PS4, you can adjust not only the general difficulty, but adjust features such as needing fast button pressing during quick time events or not. This makes it so m many people as possible can enjoy your game, including disabled gamers who might deal with fine motor functions. Pretty rad. The other credit I'll give to the writers is the Peter and Mary Jane storyline. This provides a great contrast to the Sam Raimi movies, which generally treated Chris Kirsten Dunst's MJ like a screaming prop to save. The story begins with MJ and Peter having been broken up for some months, and they run into each other while investigating the new gang in town, the Demons, led by Mr. Negative, who is perhaps my favorite villain introduced in this game. I mean, well, he's the only villain introduced in this game, but uh, my favorite villain from the game, point being. She's now a reporter for the Daily Bugle, and they become, in her own words, partners in solving crimes. Who's which brings them together romantically over the course of the story, and it's very sweet. Now, what doesn't fare so well is the writer's treatment of Jefferson Davis, Miles Morales' father, who gets caught in the crossfire of a demon's attack and dies. Now, in the comic book fandom world, we have this term called fridging, which means a character is killed just to give another character angst and narrative direction. It's a gross plot device, usually used against women by male writers, but here we see it used against a black character by white writers. So on top of the general pro-cop sentiment that was used in creating Jefferson Davis as a character by white writer Brian Michael Bendis. Now, with America being a racist police state, um, I think it's pretty obvious where all these problems lie. And I know a lot of black comics creators were not happy with, with Davis as a character. Finally, I'd like to talk about Miles. Like the movie Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, the message ends up being that anyone can be the hero in this game. Miles, Mary Jane, Aunt May. However, the game doesn't execute this anywhere near as well as Into the Spider-Verse when they have Miles getting bit by the spiders so late in the game. And they keep the stealth sections with Mary Jane and Miles to be pretty subdued and not anywhere near as fun as the open world swinging of Spider-Man. Even though there are benefits to these parts, especially the kind of point and click game aspects to those uh, sections of the game where you're not playing as Peter. Now there's a part in the middle of the game where there's lots of disaster due to the demons and to try to save his dad, Miles starts crawling underneath uh, broken cars, a little like Spidey, and balancing on beams, a little like Spidey. Now, I love this foreshadowing of Miles' abilities as a selfless hero. If Insomniac makes a sequel, I believe they should place half or all of the focus on Miles. We've had so many Peter Parker stories over the years, and this game sort of provides the definitive Peter Parker story in a way. I mean, Peter is one of the strongest elements of the game, and he's quite a cutie. But what if the, some other writers were brought in next time? Maybe someone who hasn't written Spider-Man stories for 10 years already. Spider-Verse is so much weirder, more specific, more individual. Let's hope for the next game, Insomniac goes with Miles and his specific, interesting powers and personhood. He can turn invisible. He can electrocute enemies due to the kind of spider he was bitten by. It's pretty rad. And let's hope the next Spider-Man game from Insomniac, if there is one, takes a cue from Sony Animation and tells a new story with classic elements rather than trying to breathe new life into an old story. <laughs>